Taya mentioned about being uh, intuitive healers. I think those people that listen to their heart are intuitive healers and that we have within us the capacity to heal because healing is definitely something that is um, intuitive based, right? It's, it's, it's tactile, it's sensing, it's perceiving uh, realms of, um, of feelings and emotions that go beyond uh, uh, practical understanding. So, so uh, and, and some people have the, uh, the energy that when they're in the room, others are healing from them because they're speaking in a way, in a frequency. Maria, I was mentioning to Chaya just before you came in how we measured the people's different tonalities and how their voices have a certain pitch and combining that with certain emotions. And we all come with a blueprint, the way that we speak, the way our hearts beat, the way that we transmit an energy, and also how we attract certain people and repel certain people. Like a lot of the times we, we insist on ourselves that we need to get along with everybody and be like everybody. And it's really making fun of this majestic universe with its intricate uh, perfections and details and the unique uh, peculiarities because of social media and uh, not just social media, but social conditioning. You know, our greatest fear as human beings is the, is, is the fear of rejection, fear of being cast out of our societies, of our religions, of our families, of our even of our spouses. And that drives all our actions and our behaviors. So we lose our identities in the chaos driven by fear and uh, we always get bitten in the in, in the ass by following uh, our mind and our fear because no matter i always have this expression you can be the sweetest strawberry pop tart there is out there but there's still going to be someone who doesn't like strawberry pop tarts so what do you do you're going to keep on changing right andrea you know about this in your coaching right just being yourself so so yeah welcome to all of you um we we are going to be talking about the butterfly effect, which is um, two topics, actually. They all merge into uh, multiple topics, and it's really taking things at the deep end, which is fine, uh, because the book, uh, if you all um, know that the um, uh, I am discussing from my book, so quite a few have gotten the physical copy, others have got the ebook. And if you haven't gotten a copy, then it would really benefit you in this session. So you're going to get a totality of it. And the way the book is constructed is, uh, I was talking to, uh, Maria, I was talking to Shahid about the book. And um, because Shahid's a, a friend of mine for, I don't know how long now, Shahid, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. And I was telling him how the book is constructed as a, as a symphony in different parts of the book. And, and when I was traveling around, I got the opportunity to speak about the books. It was so nice, you know. And uh, I was watching someone read the book, like s browse the book. And I never experienced that before, Maria, which is like watching someone with the book, my book in their hands, and they're going through it. And I'm seeing where they stop and where they start. And they stop at the quotes and the pictures, you know, the symbols and the, and, and the quotations as well. That's where, they, uh, where their attention is drawn to as a first, look and then later on they dive deeper into it so 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 life can be seen as a symphony and a different phases and uh, uh, most of us started start out you could say in heaven as children coming in fresh and um, you know untarnished untainted not for long right because many of us have traumatic upbringings then in our childhood environment but we come in with a very f fresh slate and then we go through life as my children are going through teenage years now, sort of trying to understand the world, trying to understand themselves to make the, the leap from childhood to adulthood. And then adulthood begins. And for most of us, it's challenging and it's getting things out there and making a success and conquering the world and finding the right partner and having children and putting a mortgage on the house. And then you get to a point in your late 30s and 40s where you start getting a little despondent the, 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 for, for many people. Some people remain uh, adolescents uh, right up till they're 60 or 70. But for many people, <clears throat> they feel like um, this is not going to happen. They're not going to become great successes. They're not going to find the perfect partner and all the rest of it. Then the despondence starts growing. And that's where the book enters, right? Um, to the next phase of your journey is where where Carl Jung, where me, where pretty much everyone, even on the call here, if you look at the age groups as well, of the people on here, they have come to that point where they're saying, you know what, we need to listen to other people. We need to start talking about other things rather than our 
our material success or our worldly achievement. And so they start looking, um, they enter into the, um, into the autumn of their lives, right? Uh, and then some of us are in our winter of our lives. Actually, I actually don't know. Ronald, I think, is still in the spring of his life. He's still our young, young man over there. So, yeah, it's just a matter of rather than how soon you are to die, but it's more of the development of the maturity of the intellect, of the wisdom, and all the rest of it. So how did I come across? So, so like I said, it's, it's in my book. So I'm going to be sharing the screen for saving time um, from those who don't have a copy of the book. But if you, if you have a copy of the book and you want to um, scroll to that page, I'm on spray, page... Uh, 87 we're talking about uh, nature of reality and in this section here you can see it's all very much intertwined and it and it and it flowed out of me as one piece which was quite something uh and i didn't realize what i was building i was just going from one thing to the other and uh, it all sort of came together in this amazing pattern uh are you guys all uh, can you see the screen that i'm sharing uh, so if any point you miss anything or you're not sure about what I'm saying, just stop me and just use your voice that then I can hear you because I'm looking at the picture. So so this entire chapter talks about the nature of reality. You don't have to read it. I'm just going through them and stopping at the um, at the appropriate places. So everything seems to be related. So I, I talk about in this nothingness and how nothingness that we talk about through the book uh, which the t title of the book is is mu which in japanese means nothingness how do you get to know nothingness how do you get to see nothingness if it's nothing so we we yeah, talk about in the book if we think of a mirror as reflecting the qualities of nothingness we can perceive we can perceive in the reflection of the mirror the objects that it reflects in other words we can see the nature of nothingness in everything we observe in the world. So let me pause there and ask you if that makes sense. So a mirror reflects nothing. You look at a mirror, there's blank. There's nothing there to perceive. But the moment you pop into the mirror, you're like, oh, there I am. You now see in the mirror your reflection. Right? This is very powerful to get. So the mirror itself does not have a form. It does not have an object reference point in there. It doesn't have a sound in there. It seems to be blank. There is nothing there. So if there were no objects to reflect uh, upon the mirror, would you know the nature of the mirror? How would you perceive a mirror if there was no objects to reflect into the mirror? Does that make sense? Yeah? So the only way you can know the nature of the mirror is in what it projects back to you, in what it reflects back to you. This is a very powerful analogy for everything I discuss in the book. Everything that we see, perceive in people, like everyone on the call now, as you look around you, you may perceive characters, traits about the person that you see on the screen. It's all a projection of the mirror inside of you. Even what you project about the nothingness is a projection of what you're projecting onto the mirror. It's all just projections. So the good way to understand this is um, in the analogy of standing in a room with mirrors on each side. Have you seen in some of these movies where there's you're in the middle, well, they show the character in the middle, and, there's, and you move your hand, and all these mirrors seem to be moving in both directions. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? That's very much, very much the nature of everything else out there, which is discussed in my book in... Indra's net of jewels. So now, Indra's net of jewels, I discovered this from a very, um, it's, it's from sacred Buddhist texts. And Indra's net of jewels is talking about how everything in existence that we see as separate, individual parts, like you see yourself as separate on the screen. I'm separate over here. We're separate entities. The ant is separate from the tree. The, uh, uh, the milk is separate from the cow. See, that's a very easy one to put. You're like, of course, yeah, milk, I get it. Cow, yeah, I get it. But can you get ant and scorpion? Can you get ant and human as being of the same? Can you get woman and man being of the same? That's easy because they're opposite. But there's these inter 
uh, very, very interspersed, interspersed uh, relationships that we can't see, we can't fathom. So Indra's net of jewels is, a, is an idea uh, saying how the gods or the god, a god or universe, has created this incredible net that is like jewels, where if you take one jewel, so the jewel being, you know, do uh, you know what a jewel is? It's a, it's something that's bright and it's shiny and it looks a mirror reflection. If you hold in one hand this mirror of this jewel and there's another jewel in this other hand, this jewel has a perfect reflection in, you'll see this jewel perfectly in this other jewel. And if there's five jewels around, each jewel is a perfect reflection of this jewel. In that way, it's that mirror in the, in the middle. The, the, the mirror in the middle analogy was used by an ancient Chinese monk who had come up with this. It's, it's not an. It's this, remember, these are not. These are not ideologies and a PhD thesis. These are how monks, people of deep reflection and meditation, perceive the nature of reality, the essences of reality. So there was a, 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 a this man who was a great monk explaining this. This, this reality to uh, uh, to a queen uh, in, in in one of the palaces and, and he said, she said I don't get it it's too complex what are you talking about and then he used the example of the mirror analogy as how the mirrors from one side reflect the others so in that way I won't talk too much because this is an in-depth topic and it's fascinating because we go from Indra's net of jewels to the hologram and then we talk about sacred geometry and how Everything is a reflection of everything else. And then you have these sacred patterns that we see in how we could call the gods or we could call the god of the universe has shaped anything, everything in this, in this perfect symmetrical uh, 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 patterns. And so when you, when, when you take all of this perfection that you see around you from your model of reality, you look at, for instance, the sunflower and you see the formula of pi and you see the perfect construction of the spiral or if you look at the shell, right? If you look at the seashell and this perfect symmetrical paddles, you find it in the fruit, you find that in nature, you find that in the formation of the Milky Way into the galaxies. It's just, it's just astonishing and it's awe-inspiring and it really blows your mind. And so from sacred geometry, and, and, and Pythagoras was one of the, I mean, I could talk for hours about each one of these topics because it, it's, it's my passion, it's, my, it's, it's what keeps me alive, and it keeps me you know, awake at night, it's just understanding these, these incredible patterns and symmetry. And it was people like Pythagoras who, who almost were, you could say, monks of orders. There was a whole thing. Pythagoras was the founder of uh, mathematics in many ways, but... It was a man very connected, fasting rituals, uh, sort of a deprivation of your senses to really get to perceive these, these incredible patterns. And then we went on to music, and Maria talks about this as well. We talk about frequencies and harmonics and how there's just this incredible, perfect pattern and how our bodies are modeled upon that, right? And we we look at the distances, for instance, I'm sure you've all seen this or maybe you haven't but you should research it um the, the body in its proportions is perfectly aligned with the wh what is it ronald 1.134 is that the right uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, the right um, mathematical equation no and that's for which one for 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 pi, for pi. Is, yes pi is 3.114 yes 3.14 pi formula yeah so so if you look at your, the distance between your hands and your and your legs and the, and the perfect um, distance between the two, I mean, it's just, if you guys are interested in this, I won't take up too much of uh, the presentation on this, but if you're interested in that, just get in touch with me. I'll send you videos that will blow your mind and you see the uh, patterns. Uh, Denise has got, got, got the book in her hand. She took a stunning picture of the, of the book, which I used on my... Uh, Denise, you're very, you have a very good eye. You, you captured that so well against the backdrop of the... What was that? Your bookshelf? No, it wasn't a bookshelf. It was like a... No, it was my, my dresser. In <laughs> Are you a dresser? Yeah, yeah. Laying in my bedroom. Ah, beautiful. Very, very, very nice. So, so, yes? Someone said I something? just want to make one quick comment. 
about uh, you're talking about the sacred geometry and how perfect us the architecture. That one where you see the Greek pantheon, I believe it is a pantheon. That's supposed to be a perfect triangle in order to support that building. When you see the front of the building with that angle, that wide, narrow angle right. supported by the columns, that I understand is supposed to be a perfect, perfect dimensions. Yeah, they they and in human beings who had the sacred knowledge did model the world around that because they knew about the sacred pattern. So that's on the sacred pattern. Of course, Tesla. We spoke. You know, we, we love Tesla, Nikola Tesla, and, and and a lot of his teachings and his understanding. And he said, if you want to know the secrets of the universe, um, then then think in terms of energy, right? Uh, and he spoke about three, six, and nine being those very very powerful patterns and three. Being the triangle is the sacred pattern. Yoga, all the moves and postures in yoga is to form the triangle. So there's, I mean, the stuff just goes just in, insanely. Uh, you know, it was one of these months where about a five years ago, I started, um, I signed up for a course on understanding sacred geometry. And I mean, it was just incredible to just to see these harmonies and symphonies and how they go from music to uh, to, to, to even even to germs. I mean, they mapped out now the entire shape of like different viruses as well, and they follow all these kind of patterns and also curing them. People like Raymond Reif and other people like that who came out with machines that targeted those specific frequencies, right? So it's it's very much what I wanted to say about that. Even though you see all these perfect patterns, there's another set of patterns that are, appear very randomly and chaotically. That's chaos theory. Now, chaos theory is you see all these unmeasurable, unquantifiable, unidentifiable, uh, you can't put it in a box, you can't put it in a shape, yet they're following this incredible symmetry and harmony. So when you look at your life and you look at how all your events have been unfolded and you go, well, you know, how is this working out? You know, I'm supposed to be now at this age, I'm meant to be this and, you know, I'm supposed to be having X amount of children and I'm supposed to have X amount of money and... Why isn't this working out like this? And because what you're doing is just how we look at sacred geometry and see the perfect alignments with the with the with pi, and we see the three point one four. We don't see because our minds are uh, pattern forming objects. The perfect harmony and symphony in your chaotic life, how you went from here and how you went from there. Now, don't take my word for it, really, because your mind. Most of our minds are so caught up on looking for patterns. I'd like to invite you, welcome you, to start investigating your world outside of patterns. And that my entire book is about taking a step back and investigating the opposites of what you can't see. So the yin-yang symbol, for instance, where we can all see you know, how our life hasn't worked out in one particular perfect pattern. And then on the other hand, if you look at it from a different angle, this is a, I use this thing called lenses. The whole book is talk about four different lenses. You look at the book from a look at your life from a different lens, and you say, "Wow, this is an incredible harmony and perfection." Except you can't be applying formulas to it. See how we come at the deduction of pi is we apply perfect formulas, but life, nature, and how things are going are not following your perception of patterns so in other words when you look at someone when you're 70 looking back at someone who's 30 or 25 and they say my life's going to end it's all terrible my girlfriend left me and now i'm pregnant or uh, my boyfriend left me or whatever and oh you look at i'm sick and i'll never get better or you know i lost all my money and you know i'll and you look at it as someone older going listen relax it's not so bad. You know, my teenage daughter was a 16 year old. Uh, the world was coming to an end, you know. And, and one of my clients said, We just had a nuclear event happening at the office. And I said, There's a little exaggeration here, right? A little context here, guys. Okay, so because we get lost in the context. So um, what I'm saying is, there is a perfect pattern in your life, except it doesn't follow your understanding. And the whole point of life, this guy said this so magnificently in an interview that I did, he said, I couldn't understand one part of your book. Maria, you'll really resonate with this because Maria helped me to with the book in many ways. And, uh, you know, so he said, 
there was a chapter in your book I couldn't get. So then I had to go and figure out what was in me that couldn't get this. I said, it was amazing what your approach was. Most people look at it and go, I don't like that. That's crap. And many people say to me, that resonated with me. That was over my head. This guy said, let me go see what I can fix in myself so that I can get what you're talking about. And I thought, imagine we approach life like that, where not just the book, but everything that we don't understand, go look at what's in us that's lacking. So if, if we look at the world and, and we go at my life, we go, oh, it's pretty crappy. And, you know, I don't have the hundred million that this guy does. And why don't I have four children like he does? And why don't I have a million dollars? What you're doing is you're really robbing yourself from your limited perspective. So I highly recommend that you see, you, you go see what's wrong with you for you not being able to see the perfect harmony in life instead of forcing life to fit your harmon harmony. Does that make sense? Isn't that mind blowing? I thought it was amazing for me as a reflection um, to rather than me seeing how life can work for me is that you know was that the saying one of the presidents said uh, uh don't say what the country can do for you ronald you know what don't say what your country can do for you but what you can do for your country how does it go yes uh, i think that was kennedy said so don't ask what your country can do for you but what can you do for your country yes. right so so uh, rather than the whole <laughs> uh, patriotic uh, uh, tinge there use that for yourself what are you not doing in how you're perceiving the perfection and the magnificence of life? Rather than look at people that are successful, look at people that are deeper than you and people that are, uh, perceive more of it. That's what I like to do is go grab these books of these Chinese monks who pick up this book and now quantum physics is proving everything they've, they've figured out. So they went there out in nature, closed their eyes and just disconnected from everything and said, it's all the same. There is a sameness. There is a oneness that... Everything is interconnected, even the butterfly. And, and, and they came up with this knowingness in their bones that in, in time, every thought is connected to another thought. Every emotion is connected to another emotion. Every, every birth is connected to every death. Every sadness is connected to every happiness. And they started getting to know this intuitively. And uh, my whole book is a welcome to you to experience life directly rather than conceptually and theoretically. Can you see the harmony and the symphony and the beginning and the end of everything? Can you see how life is eternal and yet it's fleeting? Can you see how everything is there forever and everything's gone in a flash? There, there, is, there is, in all the opposites that you perceive, there is perfect balance between them. So do, do you guys have any, uh, any, anything to add questions or stuff like that before I get on to the butterfly effect and the hologram. But if you need to say anything, ask anything, please feel free. No? Okay. So let's let's have a look at the um, further into the book. So I mentioned about nothingness perceived as a mirror. So, uh, oh, this is beautiful. Um, we talk about, I spoke above about nothingness and the mirror that it reflects. The same way, if you look at silence, silence does not have any sound, yet any sound that you make is reflected in the silence. Now, if you, if you, if you need to meditate on that, then you should get the book and really meditate on what I'm saying. But these words by Albert Camus really touched me when I found it. You know, sometimes a quote just comes to you, and you're like, wow, that is the quote I've been looking for. And this one did come to me in a very deep way. The world is never quiet. Even its silence eternally resounds with the same notes in vibrations which escape our ears. As for those that we perceive, they carry sounds to us, occasionally a chord, never a melody. So we're just getting glimpses of this nothingness of this, or this silence or this mirror and our lives that we project onto this mirror is just one, one very tiny portion of seeing the incredible nature of this mirror, of life, of the nothingness that uh, all of life is. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah? So, so moving down into that, um, this is really interesting. If you can get this, I talk here about we focus on one particular object instead of the background from which they emerge. So we can become 
oblivious to the background from which these objects originate. And now this is the this is the, this um, uh, symbolism I'm talking about. The lion is based on an uh, ancient um, teaching and a, a monk uh, uh, who came up with the teaching of um, what was it called um, the golden lion, right? So this is the ultimate arrival when you come out the other side of Buddhism and Zen and the final teachings of all of them. You come to the, the to this to the stop as in your journey of discovery to a place called the gateless gate. And beyond the gateless gate lies the golden lion. So I'm not going to go into those abstract aspects, but I wanted to tell you the depths that I went into to come to where I got this particular sculpture from. As you can tell from the sound, the gateless gate is, is, is there is no gate, and the gate is gateless. So you're now transcending well beyond logic. So I don't want to uh, throw you too far off yet but you 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 will through the book go very far off so the golden lion if you think about a golden lion you can easily focus on the sculpture and the shape of the golden lion yet you may miss seeing the gold you miss seeing the gold from which the lion sculpture was fashioned from every golden lion sculpture will contain gold yet not every sculpture produced from this gold will be a lion does that make sense guys yeah so we can miss the gold, the essence that, that, that is part of, like, for instance, if you look at DNA, right, and using a very scientific term because we're very scientist-based focus. The, the, the gods of today are the scientists, by the way. If you, if you didn't know that, we worship scientists. We don't worship anything else. In the, in the other ages, we worship the magicians. We worship the poets. This is the age of scientists. So we worship anything. that this, If the scientists said it, in those days, if, if, the, if the magician said it, people would believe it. If the storytellers that came from the desert say it, we'd believe it. Today, uh, our gods are science. If science said it, which is an ever-moving goal, goalpost, as we know, uh, one day science says cholesterol eggs are going to kill you and coffee is going to kill you, and the next day it says it's this, but it's, it's an ever-evolving thing. Ancient scientists realized this. There was an ever-moving, but modern-day scientists, I talk a lot about that on my um, podcast with Bernardo Castro, so we are materialistic-based uh, science. Um, I was talking about, right, so how everything behind all of it is DNA and there's elementary structures that is a thread between every single element we see on the planet, right? That is similar, yeah? So, so even though between us and monkeys, there's a tiny fraction how many genes are there? What's the difference in DNA? Shade, you should know this. Shade's a, a, a genius. Uh, what's the DNA difference between us and the, and, the, and the chimpanzee, our closest neighbor? Either way, if you Google it, you'll find it's like two or three. Yet, but there's this common thread of DNA. So if we look at between me and you, the difference between us, it's so minuscule. We have the same DNA. We have same protein structures. We have that. It's just that tiny kind of thing, and then you look at me and you, and we look nothing like each other, right? Yet we are pretty much carbon copies of each other, apart from one little mutation. But that little mutation makes us entirely unique. But if we focus on the lion sculpture, we miss out on the fact that we're pretty much all the same in so many different ways, in our languages and how we communicate and everything, right? So the whole point is to, instead of looking at objects and becoming so focused, because that's what we teach us as children. Focus, damn it. <laughs> it was the biggest mistake you ever made. Because the entire reality, the nature of reality, is actually in the background. The, the music comes out of the silence. The images are revealed in a mirror, the mirror of existence, of life. If you get to know the mirror, if you get to know the silence, you get to know everything. Otherwise, all you're going to do is get to know objects. And you miss the harmony. You miss the symphony of life. Yeah? I'm not supposed to be doing all the talking. We're supposed to be interacting here, guys. Why aren't we interacting? Uh, so let's get on. There's still, I realize that based on the amount of time that we've got. So I spoke briefly about internet, internet of jewels, but you came here for um, for the 99% um, of our DNA is common. Thank you, Shade. You probably got that from Google. <laughs> These days with Google, anyone can be a 
Chid, be honest. Did you get that? Richard, I told you this 10 years ago. <laughs> oh, you told me this. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, okay. See, all right. So he's getting defensive there. We don't want to upset him because he's a microbiologist. So, so let's go back to it because I'm not going to be able to go too far into it. Um, but Indra's net of jewels is explored. Basically, it's, it's a 1,500 uh, pages worth of stuff summarized into three pages. Yeah? So you'll get pretty much everything from understanding that. Um, so what's really interesting here with Indra's net of jewels is that the smallest detail of a picture is essential to reveal the whole picture. Think about it. You're looking at a picture of, I don't know, a portrait. We won't get into it, but if you really examine this in a piece of music, if there's even a small little chord is missing, that, that, that piece of music would never sound the same. So in that way, everything is interdependent. Everything is its own entity. So in other words, every piece of music is its own piece of music, yet each thing depends on everything else to express its individual nature. Please pause and reflect on that. Everything is its own entity, yet each thing depends on everything else to express its individual nature. So if you look at a piece of music, think about that. There's each separate chords and each separate chord is unique now the song that is finally composed and 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 presented is so unique because it was the it was the result of the combination of each individual entity that made this unique song in that particular way does that make sense yeah it's pretty deep for a Saturday afternoon, or actually so many people from so many different countries, this Saturday morning, this Saturday evening, this Saturday afternoon, yeah. all of it. And so, Richard, you know, can think about uh, uh, baking a cake. I mean, if you were to uh, eat it, it may taste nasty. Ronald, we're, we can't hear you so well. Uh, can you Say hear that me? again. Yeah, I can hear you now. Say that again. Yeah, I'm saying that I can watch my wife bake in the kitchen and she'll put all this stuff on the counter that would taste nasty individually. It has its own unique taste. Yeah. They taste perfect. You know, it's a beautiful cake. It passes her inspection. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. When I saw that you get put baking soda and salt and things like that, I said, what's that doing in the chocolate cake? But it, without that, it's not going to happen. And now if you apply that to married life, relationships um uh, work situations and that's where our focus and that's what i teach teams and leaders as well they're always focusing on the strong guys oh look at him social media as well right? and it's only the, the people with the most amount of uh, clicks and posts yet you know i did i did a, a um a evaluation on 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 all the mystical spiritual um influences of the 20th century uh, and the 21st century and I realized that only a few people have been highlighted. All the knowledges that we've got and all the understandings that we've got from a small percentage of people, and we've discarded all the rest of it. And we think spirituality started 100 years ago, that this quantum physics discussion that we're having, all of this is all regurgitated stuff. Yet, you talk to someone, um, for instance, um, you know, uh, Blake, right? Ronald, William Blake. This guy was in the 1600s, correct? 1600s? On another level, but we never ever heard of him. Nobody even talk about him. If you read William Blake, his famous line, Ronald, in your voice, do you remember the lines of William Blake, the one that we quote all the time? Oh yes, about the uh, uh, holding infinity in your hand. Grain, grain of sand, yeah. Yes, a grain of sand in the flower and seeing infinity and time and eternity. Yes. Yeah. So that's William Blake's uh, beautiful, um, if you just type into Google later, you can make a note of it. Just type in William Blake, grain of sand, and you'll read this most beautiful painting, uh, most beautiful poem that describes the essence of what I'm talking about here. Remember, this stuff that I'm talking about was discovered at least 3,000 years ago, right? So um, there's, a, there's a real common thread. So fast forwarding, 
we're going to be I, we, we could... I just wanted to add something to that yes please go ahead it, yeah, yeah sure. so as a self-taught abstract artist i've realized that um it's it's the combination <laughs> just like how you described in music it's the combination of marks it's just marks uh it's dark it's light um and it's just the combination um uh, uh, that emits that uh beauty uh it's together uh, and I've realized that it's a self-discovery process, yeah. um, and uh, and then when I take them to shows, it it um, evokes certain emotions in people, and right. suddenly they tear up. So it is that, and if you if someone, and it also depends on who's looking at it. So the mirror effect, all of that uh, comes into play when I. Uh, it's all about my art when I see and uh, how people react, and how I paint. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to make that. Yeah, no, that's a very good addition, actually, Chayo, because. There's so many elements and facets that we don't understand yes. because there is the person painting it, then the person perceiving how people yeah. who will see that painting would respond to the painting. Correct. You're only getting one level. Then there is the, the individual senses in the eyes that are perceiving of the uh, painting. Then there is the perceptions in the mind of the person. Then there's the emotional baggage which that person brings onto the table as they look at the painting. And then that that starts the whole process of is the artist standing with the canvas expressing something that is so uniquely personal about their emotional state of their understanding of reality and then someone else as the book chaya my book then you find someone else says i get it you know or someone who writes this piece of music and that's where artists and, and creators can really screw themselves over by trying to put themselves in the box, right? And I remember me, Maria, when I was writing it, I said, I don't know if anybody will like it. And, or, you know, should I include this or not include that? And she says, you write it for you. All right. And Jaya, I know that's how you paint. You paint for you. Yes. The musicians, From my heart. Play. Yes. Yeah. So, so if we lose creativity in this world, we as a human species are doomed. I don't people, I don't think people understand the significance that, and they are the ones that are least compensated, yet they place the, plays the most vital element in society. It's not the intellectuals. It's not the business people. It's the artists. It's the poets. It's the musicians. It's the painters. It's these people that speak of a language because they get the essence of the secrets of the cosmos. They're transmitting it to us. You see, in a music, you're hearing this you're hearing the sounds of the heavens in the words of the poetry that don't make sense something else is transmitted there but when you're speaking rational sense and you're reading a book on psychology or you're reading a book on economics or even of modern day um, physics you're missing the essence of life and if these people disappear then we're finished as a human species because there won't be any emotions and, and that's ai right because you see ai can't produce these things they can copy but everything we're creating is an individual expression of the nothingness that contains everything so every single permutation or every single possible combination is is in nothingness and through the artist creating minds are the most fulfilled well not always it depends uh, uh, it depends on the particular creative mind so this is how I'd like to show you the difference between AI and my perception of it. You have this nothingness or the, the blank canvas that the painter then sits on and does some scribbles on, and they think they've made a unique thing. They've made a unique expression of something that contained everything together. You now brought it out from the unseen, you could say. AI takes all the permutations of everybody who's brought everything out from the unseen and then and perpet and, and purports to create something unique it's not right so 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 we cannot now if that unique expression coming out of this nothingness is not allowed to flourish and express and be rewarded because that's the thing someone would say should i become an artist or should i become an accountant people would choose becoming an accountant or an ai programmer or a you know, whatever it is, who's going to go sit there going, well, I, I love art. I love being creative. 
And that's, I think it's going to be this destruction in many ways of society. And I know there'll be an uprising. I'm not a doom and gloom kind of person. Uprising in the sense that there will be a resurgence of art and culture and painting. And as we see, someone like Chaya here, I mean, we've got three or four musicians. Hayat, welcome, Hayat. We haven't seen you in a long time. Welcome, Caroline. Welcome, Sadia. Martha hasn't said anything, but I'm assuming she's there. Um, welcome to all of you. Um, yeah. So, uh, anything to add? To the... Sadia, yes. I was just saying uh, hello and thank you for welcoming us. I'm just uh, very engaged in what you're saying. Okay. I'm not going to say anything at the moment. I'll be a sound app, just going to listen. <laughs> oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, yes, Ashif. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add something. I come from a creative industry for about 30 years and... Uh, you know, resurgence, uh, our best year was after 9-11. Yeah. And it just shows you how people let go of basic life that makes them happy. And when they touch what they're supposed to touch, it changes their lives. Hmm. Because it's within them. It's a need. And it was a major catalyst, was a traumatic event like that, was, that shook you up and said, Hey, what are we doing here? Which is which is which is amazing in that it happened after 9-11. Thank you. I just wanted to add it. No, that's brilliant. I mean, that's true. Because we're sitting here thinking, okay, how much money we're gonna make and uh, you know, uh, uh, how many court cases we're gonna win and how many uh, you know uh, it's all just the whole Western system, our not Western, every systems, but strengthening the economies, uh, strengthening the legal system, strengthening the military, which is all great. I'm not saying go through all of that away. But it's only when the shit hits the fan and the buildings blow up and people are dying and you're going, well, that's the story of Rumi, right? It was Rumi who was a scholar, very much of an astute uh, scholar of, uh, of religious studies. And then Genghis Khan with his hordes, these Mongols, came across there and started murdering like you can't, like never seen before, right? Putting heads up in, in the, you know, of children, women and children, everybody. In display, and that was in when Genghis Khan's army came to the city of Balkh, uh, in uh, I think it's near modern day Afghanistan or closest to um, uh, to, to Turkmenistan. Uh, I'm not sure about the exact location, and they had no choice but to leave. Now, Rumi, being a scholar and coming from a religious type of upbringing, was now thrust across the entire Arabian Peninsula or from, from you know, from Persia all the way across it ended up somewhere in Turkey, right? Konya, and finally settling there. He discovers love and the mysteries of the universe, being chased by the Mongols, watching his family being butchered and chopped to pieces. Now you talk about 9-11, Ashif, and then this resurgence of art. Until today, Rumi is known as one of the most popular poets, yet people don't know. It was in the fire. It was in the hell. It was in the war. It was in the blood and guts of life it wasn't sitting in a rose garden that this music and this poetry and these lines that are so profound that people can't even copy today people everybody's trying to copy rumi but he had so much pain in him, he had so much struggle and that's when he met shams tabris at some point in his life it was before he met shams tabris that he was quite boring in that sense remember he was contributing to the world he was the accountant he was a logician he was the you know theolo theologian and then comes in this man, Shams Tabris, this, you know, they call him this drunken man in his rags, right? A Sufi of the highest order, and throws his life upside down. And this, and this, and Rumi, and I always say this in my coaches as well, is that someone sees something in you. There's a true essence that they pick up in, in what, you're, what you're transmitting, rather than the words that you're saying. And they say, I've got to listen to this person. There is something in what they're saying that I feel in me. And that's what it was, this Shams Tabriz coming in, throwing up his whole classroom, right? And him saying, something about this guy. And it's not madness, it's something. Even in artists, we see the madness because it's in us. We want more of it, you know? So, so I'm all for that and, um, and bringing that up. Now, <laughs> we we got quite a lot of time and I'm full of passion today. So excuse me for diverting off. But it's all your input that uh, that uh, that allows more expression there. So speaking of Shams, 
What a wonderful place. Oh, does someone want to say something? We can hear a mic on. Yes, no, uh, Richard, what you were saying, I just want to follow up with that. You know, when you, um, when I think it's uh, like Rumi that said that uh, it's only when you burn that you can emit your light. So the thing is, um, you know, I, am I correct in saying that sometimes the struggles in life, you know, what we go through, it's, that itself is a creative process that, that, it, that it actually um, it reveals another side of you in the mirror. You know, you, you begin to unfold and reveal yourself in different ways because of what you go through. 100%, 100%. That's what I talk about a lot in the book, right? In that you can't know joy unless you've known grief, right? You can't know growth unless you've known stagnation. All of these opposites coming together. And what comes to mind is Jung, right? If you look at Carl Jung, I mean, he's just sh showing you that how in your darkest days, in the shadow, in those places that you didn't know, now, remember, don't get me wrong, because people can misunderstand that the victims understand what I'm saying very wrong. You've got you to grow up and not being a victim, talking to myself firstly. You'd be like, oh, yeah, my life's been terrible, and now it will get better. You've misunderstood the point. You created a miserable life. It's not going to get better until you change. So what Jung and Rumi talk about is the transformation of the self. Not sitting there going, well, you know, I didn't get chocolate today. I had to eat, you know baking soda tomorrow will get the chocolate no you still haven't understood you're carrying on like an adolescent nobody here specifically but that's what we do we're like okay well you know she upset me i'll divorce her and i'll go marry the pretty girl over there and she'll make me happy you're missing the point you're like and then you and then people rumi this wonderful thing that someone came up with and said people uh, rumi says in his lines he said all these poems have got nothing to do with your girlfriend or your boyfriend because people read rumi and they're like Oh, you see, I told you I love you. It's not. Because, because people, you know, uh, part of the six human needs or the Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, one of them is spirituality. And people think we're talking about God here. No, we're talking about you. Spirituality is you getting to know the essences of yourself through the darkness that exists within you. To come out of the other side and from yourself, you will know God in you. You will know God out there. So, 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 so the whole journey is the journey within. Oh, Martha, you are there. Okay, good. I used to love to paint. Then at a young age, my teacher and classmates made fun of my painting. I've been so critical of my work. Well, that's your loss, right? You, got to, you definitely should go back to it because if there's a gift in there for you, forget about these idiots that criticized your work. They weren't idiots, but whatever it was, I mean, get back to it. So um, where was I? Uh, Let's get back to my little um, to the book. So, I think we could we could stop here, and I could have an, we could continue the session on the butterfly effect as we're coming up to an hour mark, and people start dropping off. So, Shams Tabriz, we spoke about the teachings of um, Rumi and how uh, his life changed when he met um, when Rumi met the Shams met Shams. And remember, Rumi Shams was searching for Rumi as Rumi was searching for Shams. So, so some people say one is the lover and one is the beloved. In fact. This analogy then transcends into very much of the uh, mystical understanding of life, which is what Rumi talks about is that what you seek is seeking you, right? So it's not one looking for the other. It's not like, oh my God, I've been looking for you my whole life. I've been looking for you too all my whole life. It doesn't work one way. It's always two ways, right? Uh, and in fact, the correct translation of that, which most people don't know of the Farsi uh, poem of Rumi, what you seek is seeking you is that, it's actually not what he says in Farsi. What he says is that you are what you seek. There's a big difference. You are what you seek. You are it. There is no what you seek is searching you. You are what you're searching for. You are the complete picture. But we, we look out there for completion. And Rumi is saying you are everything complete within yourself. So let's see what... Oh, look at that. <laughs> Sham says the universe is a complete from complete unique entity. Everything and everyone is bound together with some invisible strings. And this is precisely what I was talking about um, when I was um, talking about how you can't see the interrelatedness of the, of the most obscure types of things, yet there is a relatedness. And remember, humans are related to each other, but we fail to see many of the times our connection to the fish and to the whale into the dolphin and to the flowers and to the stars and to different elements of nature gold silver copper we're 
directly related to all of them. And I'm not talking from a scientific uh, chemical extraction point of view. Then he says, the past is interpretation. The future is an illusion. The world does not, this is, apart from this, which many of the great sages say, this is what I found quite profound to me. The world does not move through time as if it were a straight line proceeding from past to the future. Instead, time moves through, through and within us in endless spirals. This, um, this entire poem captures the findings of quantum physics in the modern day times. Then he says here, the next line, which I can talk about in depth. Instead, the eternity does not mean infinite time, but simply timelessness. You see, when we talk about infinity, we have a concept of time, but in the dimensions outside of Earth and outside of us, time does not exist. So in order for, for us to say infinity, we're attributing that with with the characteristic of time but time does not exist so infinity and eternity don't pretty much exist either in that understanding but that's you know we can explore that further if you want to experience eternal illumination illumination he says not time not eternity not anything just eternal illumination put the past and future out of your mind and remain with the present moment shams debris this is him reported to have said, not a direct uh, um, translation, because he has his own uh, divan, which is his own uh, poetry as well. So, does that make sense to you guys? What uh, what, what Shams is saying. So, these, if you look at what the Zen monks and the Taoist masters and what the Sufis are saying, and that's the essence of my 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 book is to bring together Eastern not really west, east and east, I guess, we want to use locations and compass, but, you know, the, yeah, it is deep, Martha. so it's very deep, in fact, and it's so beautiful. So just as we spoke about uh, sacred geometry, my other interest is time. So I took the, I can talk about time in its uh, human uh, form in our perception in tremendous detail, and it's a fascinating topic, just from a human understanding of time like how we perceive time and how time is measured and how it, how our bodies perceive time for instance your body uh, the organs in your body only have a 24-hour cycle they're either they're on for 12 hours and off for 12 hours every cell in your body doesn't ever keep time your body does not keep time your body resets every 12 hours there's a 12 hours rhythm going so so then what ages you if your body constantly on every day resets time you should not be aging in that case Happiness is timeless within. Okay, I agree. So then, yeah, so what's aging us, right? So that's something that baffles scientists as well. There is no aging mechanism in the body because every, 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 uh, every part or every organ of your body is composed of cells and tissues and, and in each particular cell is just resetting on a 12-hour clock. Either way, that'll be my next book if I ever end up writing about time. I love the topic, but we don't have the time for it. Right now. <laughs> Very appropriate. Alana, wasn't that a good one? Alana, you like jokes. That was a good joke, right? <laughs> Alana's like, no, that was a bad joke. <laughs> Can't hear you, Alana. Oh, you're away from your... Either way, we're going to... Can you oh, hear yeah. me now? Yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that was a good joke. That's a good okay. joke. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Alan. <laughs> You're always in very picturesque places. Then uh, there you are. Uh, um, that, this is a feature. I just put on. This is not my background. Oh, There's something okay. on um on the app itself. I just discovered oh. it, so I'm playing around oh. with it. <laughs> but you don't need effects. You live in paradise, Alana. I live in paradise. That's so true. I live. I live in the Caribbean. It's just always beautiful. The view is just but it's, incredible. It's drizzling but... outside now, so I'm inside. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you yeah. guys have any um, questions or feedback? I, I will take this topic to the other side um, in our next session and and and, and really expand on it uh, when it comes to. Uh, I want to bring together the hologram, the butterfly effect, and the nothingness as well. Yeah, she is lucky. We're all lucky in one way. Remember, that's perception as well, right? Any thoughts? Any reflections, guys? Something. When yes. you 
when you, yes, when you talk about man and woman, you can say that a woman <laughs> is different from a man, but that's in comparison. But a woman in her totality is unique mm. throughout the entire universe. Yes. So we're not looking at differences. We're looking at uniqueness, all to us in essence and totality. Yes. Well said. It's it's the uniqueness and then the combination of our uniqueness and how we come together, the totality, exactly what you said. But the mind or the ego, what it likes to do, it likes to discriminate, individualize. It's, you know, in the book, as you know, Ronald, uh, we got this from Aristotle. M many people don't realize that our logic and our thinking is based on language and language is based on certain logic. And we got our logic and understanding from Aristotle. Aristotelian logic as I explain again in the book, is basically this or that, left or right, black and white. So is it a man? Is it a woman? In fact, you know, we're not talking about transgender here, but in fact, the, the actual combination of male and female together, that's what we all were before we had individual sexes. We were the same, right? Before the um, expression of our um, sexual organs and chemicals and hormones, which is so magnificent how the wonder, how it all happens and, and um, the perfection of it. And the more you look at nature, the more you you look in wonder. The problem is if only you, all day you're looking at your problems and, you know, your struggles and your career and all the rest of it, you miss out. And, you know, so one of my prayers is that keep me free so that I can just be here and ponder the mysteries of life as they are. I don't have to go discover them, but whatever's here, you know, the bee and the 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 trees and the human beings. It's not about running away. We're so amazing just as a species or as a, as a people. Uh, we're so unique in our expression. Anything else, guys, before we... Yes, Maria. Can I say the story about me and Ronald? Oh, yes, of course. Thank you for reminding me. Tell me. So, it's a bit... It happened a couple of weeks ago, but it has to do with timelessness. It has oh. to do with energy, which is the butterfly effect. Because I was thinking, so Ronald st started saying a few things that resonated with me. I said, I know this guy somehow. So I started, <laughs> I started sending him messages. And whatever Ronald comes up as an answer, it's always as if he uh, helps me understand the past. So much, Ronald, that I think you were Greek. I am convinced. Somehow we have met before. Now, what <laughs> what happened a couple of weeks ago? A couple of months ago, Ronald introduced me on LinkedIn with a composer, Vincent Kennedy, who is in Ireland. But he did it as a message, uh, Maria. This is so we became linked there. And uh, this composer, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, posted something about a Greek composer which uh, had the concert coming up in Athens. Now, what happened, I know that composer. When I was 19 years old, I went to his house and I, I interviewed him when he was very young. But what are the chances of Ronald, this Irish guy, well, I don't know if he's Irish, but, and the Greek guy become one chain in my story? I was thinking, I mean, what is the meaning of that? It doesn't mean anything, but it means something as well. I think is as, as the butterfly effect concerned, is the intention we put out there that comes back to the people that we put the intention as a blessing. So because Ronald did it with, a, with his good heart and he did it with a good intention, this thing happened for me, which it doesn't mean anything, but the chances of this being a random event are very slim, I think. It's, it's too... It's, too, I don't know, too unique to be uh, yeah. random. So that's how I understood the butterfly effect and this timelessness. So like, as if Ronald was there when I was 19. So it is like that. And even with your book, it's difficult to write a book. But what we do with books, we put them out there in, in hope that there is another soul that might find something useful there. That, that's the whole purpose. Otherwise, books usually become coffee coasters. It's not, they're not, they're not really. Yeah, so I was thinking that story with Ronald. Thank you, Ronald. Yeah. Yes, you thank you, Maria. Maria, because that ties into a, a, a good experience in your life as you're trying to 
continue on in your growth and your new music. You know, you're trying to have new music, revive the music. And, and it's coming out in so many different ways. And, and that reminded you what it was like to be a student at that time with hopes and ambitions. Yes. Right. Okay. So maybe Thank that you. Was no, it's very relevant, in fact, uh, because, yeah, we that's something that I really want to explore, is that, uh, you see, you, you saw, you were looking for patterns and you found them, right? You saw some patterns, but in fact, there are patterns across the entire cosmos and that everything is related to everything else. The problem is the eyes and the brain and the senses that we have is constantly structured on looking for what's in front of it. It's like, well, that's got nothing to do with that. And it uses logic, which is based on uh, the Newtonian. Us as a species are very confused in the last uh, 500 years. We don't realize that we're in a little pocket. It's not it's not ancient. We are confused people and, and very disconnected in many types of ways. But then quantum physics, which is the remedy for the confusion in our society, is now proving, you know, in, in Einstein's experiment, he called it... Uh, um, uh, 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 what did you call it? Spooky. What was it called, uh, Ronald? Spooky. Uh... Yes, spooky entanglement. Yes. No, no. But what did he call entanglement? Well, he said it was spooky. No, well, he's we're... got a name for it. I thought you had Google in front of you. Um, spooky. Inside the world. Spooky. Uh, Einstein. Okay. Well, I won't get into it now because it takes too long. But I'd like to talk in depth about that because he couldn't figure out certain things and how things that according to his logic and his rationale, but he was smart enough and, and, and intuitive enough to, um, uh, uh, to not make a conclusion on it. And, and, and this, this topic of entanglement is very much related to the quantum world. It's not, you remember, there is no quantum world. There is our world. It's just investigating particles at the subatomic level, right? So it is our world. It's just that they've got different type of instruments and different ways of measuring that. So we'll talk about the energetic realms. With, and remember, tele, telepathy, uh, co-location, astral projection, lucid dreaming, none of these are possible if the universe was not interconnected. And I'm talking about not Earth. I'm talking about the entire, whatever you want to call that, because people can call it a cosmos, you call it the universe. But we can Travel, it's, it's, it's no travel. Travel is not the right word because there is no time and space, right? Yeah, but we know. It's not what, of, what? Is it for the law of attraction? Yeah, well, law of attraction does add into that. Yeah, but remember, law of attraction was something that was discovered. Just like how people talk about the quantum world, there is this law of attraction, right? But it's not a law, right? It's a name well, given. For example, like when I designed my bags, and I was like, oh, I, I just really need to meet somebody in the, the airline industry. I went out for dinner two weeks ago, and this couple that were sitting right beside they were starting to talk about how terrible their luggage was. <laughs> and for travel, like they're pilots, they fly the 777s. And, I'm, and they start talking to me, and I'm like randomly talking to me. Yeah. And I and then I said, well, I actually I designed travel toiletry bags, like luxury bags. And they're you're kidding me. I ended up meeting with them yesterday. I mean, this was random, and this is like an hour away from here that I happened to be going to this particular restaurant at that exact time, and there was a snowstorm, and I had I was going to turn around and go back home again, but I continued going because a truck wouldn't let me get off the highway. So I don't know. There. No, absolutely, Denise. So, look, listen, just to add on to that, a very exciting thing that you just mentioned, I'd like to tell you that there are no random events, yet everything is random. So, look at this. There is a universe out there that's entirely random, okay? There is this person in here looking at this work, and you just said, look how random it is. Now, there is another universe out there that is perfectly, synchronistically planned in perfect harmony. Now, if you change the lens with which you look at the world with, right, there is no randomness. You're like, I wanted it yesterday, and today the airline showed up. You, 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 what you're doing, you're just tuning in. Instead of you being on that dial of that frequency, you're just tuning in. So now there is no randomness, and I go out and get what I want because the universe is in perfect harmony with me. 
it's, it's quite it's quite profound actually so then you know we talk about Rimbo I spoke about chaos uh, right so we looked at sacred geometry and the perfect patterns and then on the other side we're looking at chaos theory which is that in all this randomness that you call there's a perfect pattern but the whole important aspect out of all of this is the observer it's you mm. right you are observing all of this and what you bring to the table is what creates and changes reality, right? This famous quantum physicist, I don't know if I quote him in the book, but John Wheeler, I'm sure I did because every week I mention this thing. He says, of all of my research, the only thing that I know conclusively is that we live in a participatory universe, which means that we are participating in the universe. So it's what you, we are in this universe that changes the universe to us. It's, it's mind blowing, right? So, so you are, uh, what, like Rumi says, I'll end off with the last line with Rumi is that you're not the ocean in the drop. Uh, you're not a drop in the ocean, you're the ocean in the drop, right? So, so that is the expression that you are the ocean. You are the ocean. And, and if you think about this, if you can answer this question, I'll give you a thousand dollars, right? So, if you didn't exist, can you prove that the universe would have existed without you? Right? Yeah. Thousand dollars too little to answer that question. Prove I wouldn't be here to prove it. Right. So, but, yeah, but yeah, but I'm not talking about in the past. I'm asking you a question in the now. But don't answer that because that's a 45 minute discussion. But there is no conclusive evidence that you can tell me that if you're not here, that the universe would exist. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, something to think about in relation to the Rumi quote that the universe, um, that, that you are the universe contained within you. Right? That's what he said. Stop acting so small. Mm -hmm. You are the universe in ecstatic motion. So he's giving you little secrets in there that the quantum physicists in our confused times are um, sharing with us right now. Any other questions, thoughts, guys? Yes. Thank you for your wonderful input because it really adds value. Ron, sorry, yeah, Ron? Sorry. No, I do feel grateful that I could have played a role in you meeting that composer again, Maria. That is a blessing to me. And I'd like to say to see the world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Yes, that's William Blake. Beautiful. Yes, William Blake. And in Ronald Henderson's special voice, he's got this perfect voice for reading poetry. And uh, you are limitless. We all are absolutely. Uh, and it's not self-flattery. It's actually true. <laughs> Thank you. So, all right, guys. Thank you. Yeah, see you guys week after next. We're going to keep this up every second week as much as my momentum and energy can sustain myself. Oh, there's little flags that you can throw in there. See people throwing up uh, little stars. How did you do that? That's cool. <laughs> uh, all right. All right, guys. Uh, see you all week after next. Okay. Oh, there we go. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.